Hello and happy Friday. We're actually doing it on a Friday today. Um, I know I always say this, but as usual, we will wait a few moments for people to join before we kick off. See, we've got one view already. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And oh, it's climbing. Give it a few more moments before we start. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're having a nice day. I hope you're looking forward to the weekend. I hope it's been a good week. I hope 2020 has been going well for you so far. Hello, Julie. How are you? Nice to see you. Hello, Anya. Glad as always to have you here. It's very reassuring to see your name pop up in the comments. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me well. Hi, Joe. Hello. We're, uh, we're experimenting. After the gremlins we had the following week, we've invested in a new microphone, hence my lack of headset. Um, but if the sound is echoey or you're struggling to hear me, do let me know and I will see what I can do to fix that. Hello, Karen. Hope all is well in Harrogate. As I said, I'll give it, give it another 30 seconds. I'll wait till we get up to 100 viewers and then I'll kick off. That might be a bit presumptuous of me, actually. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, that'll do. Let's go. So, happy Friday. Thank you very much for joining. Um, as always, I'm Alex Cox. This is our Friday live broadcast. This is the second one we've done in a week. We did one on Monday, um, which was a very good one. We had a lot, a lot of engagement, a lot of people joining the conversation, a lot of people commenting. So maybe we should actually look at doing two of these a week. But what, why are we here and what are we talking about today? Well, if you're tuning in for the first time and I said, ah, uh, hi from the frozen north. Hello, Linda. Hello, Denise in Macclesfield. Um, glad to hear 2020 is going well for you, Anya. Uh, hello, Karen. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Right. Yeah, we'll start now. We've got a good number of people here. So why are we here? Well, if you're watching for the first time, and I sincerely hope you are, uh, we do these every single week. It's a place for people to hang out and chat in the comments, discuss family history. Um, apologies if you've heard this multiple times before, but if you are a beginner and you're looking to start your family history, this is a great place to hang out because you are joining a very active community, very knowledgeable researchers who uh, I see it every single week go above and beyond to help people get started, uh, help people with research queries. So if you are a beginner or you're stuck on something and you have a question, pop them in the comments and I'm pretty certain someone is going to help. Um, so what are we talking about today? Well, uh, in the UK, um, the uh, Sam Mendes' new World War One blockbuster, 1917, a film I've been itching with excitement to see, uh, hit cinemas in the UK today. Actually, that is what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm going to go and see it tomorrow, and I cannot wait. So um, as this is such a big film, it's been the critics have already been giving it tons of praise. It did very well at the Golden Globes the other week. I wanted to discuss the history behind it, and there's some really, really, really fascinating history behind it. Uh, Sam Mendes has been very public about his keen interest in World War One and how the film is based quite, well, closely is the wrong word, but it is based on the exploits of his, I think it's his grandfather, great-grandfather, um, Alfred Mendes. And um, as you will see, because I will tell some of their stories very later, um, there are many men who had incredible stories and did incredible acts of bravery, just like the characters depicted in the film. Uh, well, what is it about? Well, if you haven't seen the trailer yet already, uh, the film is set in April of 1917. Well, at the height of uh, the war um, in northern France, two young British soldiers, uh, Lance Corporal Schofield and Blake, are given a very, very dangerous mission uh, to hand deliver a message to the 2nd Battalion of the Devonshire Regiment to call off their planned attack on German forces. Uh, basically, what happened in April, well, in the film is, and there, there's a, there is some crossover with the real history and again I will talk about that in a bit. The Germans feigned a retreat to the Hindenburg line and are prepared to ambush a battalion of about what 1600 men. Blake's brother is among them and um, the two men are given this very important and dangerous mission to cross miles of enemy territory and deliver this message to avoid slaughter. Uh, and as I said it's based on some very real history. Runners, messengers, trench runners, whatever you want to call them, were um, played an integral role on world, during the First World War. They were often a last resort solution, um, and it was an incredible dangerous job, incredibly dangerous job. 
Uh, and we've already found quite a few real life runners in our records. Quite a lot of them won the Victoria Cross because often they were asked to do incredibly dangerous things. They were often to bra- they were often asked to brave you know, heavy artillery fire, machine guns, snipers. The Germans often knew that they were ca- carrying important messages, so would specifically target them. It was not a feat to be taken lightly, and many of these men did lose their lives in the process. But we've already found about five of them in our collection of Victoria uh, Cross records, and I'm very looking forward to telling you their stories. So yeah, as, as we're discussing all things 1917, uh, the theme of this video is very much military ancestors and the First World War. Apologies for the noise you can hear. It's because I'm using my new microphone, which is also a speaker. I know this is a subject we have covered many, many times before, but it, it's just such a huge part of world history, especially British, British history as well. It influenced so much and impacted so many families, pretty much everybody with uh, English, every, pretty much everybody with British ancestry will have at least one member of their family or extended family who served or impacted by the events of the First World War, which is why I don't feel bad discussing it again. Um, and to celebrate the release of the film, we have released some uh, new military records as well as updates to existing collections. Sorry, someone is, I'm getting messages from colleagues asking me to do things. I can't do it now, I'm doing a broadcast. Um, so yeah, so with, with, with that in mind, uh, our question of the week, given that one of the set, one of the record collections we've updated is a collection of First World War soldiers' medical records, is did any of your ancestors become a casualty of war? And if you know that could mean were they were they wounded? Did were they tragically killed? Did did they uh, develop an injury or a disability that affected them for the rest of their lives? Basically, or, or were they a psychological casualty? Did they come back? Uh, not the same per- when they came back, were they not the same person that left? We want to hear about it. Share your stories tell us um oh we've already got someone who's seen it um C- cynthia robson mckenzie has just saw the film this morning wow you didn't hang about i i'm loving the enthusiasm uh and she's absolutely excellent some of it was filmed near our family farm whoa where our grandfather lived he was in france in 1917 that is some incredible um overlap isn't it that's incredible uh and 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 so I'm assuming I'm wondering, did you see any of the of the of the set being built? I'm going to tell you a little about the set in a minute because Sam Mendes's commitment to accuracy is is very very admirable. Uh, they they really went to great efforts to ensure everything was accurate. So very, before we kick off into all the fascinating stories around the film, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Alfred Mendes and his war. Uh, I will also tell you the stories of the real runners. I will also tell you about some of the real life events that influenced influenced the plot. Uh, and if we have time, Colin Firth, who is also one of the movie stars, uh, I, I've spent a couple of hours this week doing his family tree. Uh, I found one of his first World War ancestors who was actually in France at the time the film is set. Uh, but I've also found loads of interesting stories. He's got all sorts kinds of connections to British India. Uh, and let's just say religious faith, strong religious faith, that was ran deeply in his family across many generations. But hopefully we'll get to that in a little bit. And I will be sharing loads of blog posts with you as well, give you something to read over the weekend. Uh, but let's just see. Um, and yeah, question of the week. I mentioned on Monday about my great grandfather, who I've just found, you did, just found in the military tribunal records from 1917 by Scotland's People, another fantastic website. He was trying to show he shouldn't be sent back to the front. He'd had a heart problem that had been highlighted before when he was serving. Two regiments had turned him down and he'd failed a medical. His place of work put in request to keep him working for them and he was only rec- and he was recommended for garrison duty only. His appeal was rejected. Oh, that poor man. Uh, hello, Nicola. Hello, Linda. Hello, Karen. Uh, Linda said, my paternal granddad was wounded twice, gassed and then spent two years as a pr- prisoner of war. Wow, he came through though. That's, incred- that's incredible. And Karen DeBurn said, my great grandfather served in the First World War at the Battle of the Somme, as did mine. Uh, he took his own life in 1928. Oh, God, imagine going through all that and surviving that. And it's truly tragic. And, and, and I wonder if it was because of PTSD. I mean, obviously, you can't be certain about these things, but it's, it's certainly more than likely, I'd say. And that's another thing to remember, that not all the, not all the wounds incurred during wartime are physical. Um, the mental ones are just as damaging. And, and oh, very, very sad indeed. Um, oh, silly. Well, I'm very glad. I'm so, I don't know why people haven't been getting the notification, but I'm glad you're here anyway. Um, Ah, the Stone, Stonehaven Fireballs in Aberdeenshire that we were discussing on Monday. Uh, Denise McKnight, strangely, none of my ancestors seem to have been actively involved in World War One. 
doesn't necessarily mean the family uh, weren't impacted in some way. I thought my great grandfather had, as he died in 1917, but he turned turns out he died in hospital after being ill for some time. I wonder if it was Spanish flu. Could well be. Uh, other other responses we had to our question of the week earlier was uh, Felicity Janet Gilks, who said, my uncle was killed by a mine en route back to the UK after Operation Dynamo, a.k.a. the Dunkirk evacuation, age 18. And again, how tragic, you know, survived the beach evacuations to be killed by a mine, probably within sight of home as well. Uh, he was a naval recruit just after training. Uh, and he is remembered in a more at Leon C as well as the Chatham House. I've read all avail available relevant documents at the National Archives and 20 years ago um, at, at the Lee Local History Museum. His death had a terrible effect on my mother, then aged 15, or I can imagine. He was evacuated from her school at Attingham Park at the time. He died in a bawly boat along with three fishermen. Oh, so sad. Those heroic men who went out on the small boats, risked life and limb to get the lads home. Um, these small boats, were yeah. Wow, very, very sad. Um, while it's very sad, obviously, discussing these stories, it's important we remember them. I, I, I say that a lot, but it's very true. And Amanda Reed, um, another one of our regular viewers, um, a superstar, has said, I suppose we were lucky, but both my grandfathers survived the First World War. Don't think they were injured and never mentioned. My father, too, came back from the Second World War uninjured, but I have no idea of any stories because he was in Italy along with my uncle. Um, Wow. So, yeah, some fantastic things sent in there by viewers very kindly. Um, Karen Alcott said both my great grandfathers died, uh, one on the 1st of December 1917 and the other on the 2nd of December 1917. Well, as we will, as we will discuss, the 2nd 1917 was a very busy year during the war. There were some very, very, very dreadful battles fought. Um, um, and Janet Fisher, I've been chasing up my family tree. So far, a great grandfather and great uncle who died on the Western Front, plus another great uncle who came home from Gallipoli with severe wounds, although he survived for many years. There you go. All these comments are a prime example of the dreadful toll the war had. But anyway, before we dig into the fascinating history of 1917, I'll do a very quick mention of the records we have released this week. Um, if you are a new viewer and you're wondering what on earth I'm on about, um, Every single week we add brand new records to our site and this week is no different. If you want to know more about the records we add, you can go to the What's New section of our blog and here is this week's blog post which will direct you straight to the records we've updated and will also tell you what's included. Uh, I won't go through them in too much detail because there's so many, so much other interesting stuff to discuss, but we'll do a very quick whiz through. So um, we've added about, not military records, but related to a to wartime. So we've added about eight, we've opened up a further 85,000 85, closed records in the 1939 register. If you're wondering what that means, basically when we launched the 1939 register, because it didn't fall under the Census Act, we were able to release it before the 100 year period, which meant it was packed with information relating to living individuals. Obviously that can't be available online, so we had to redact anyone we assumed to be dead. But since we've been, since we've launched the register, we've been constantly matching as many records as we can to multiple sources to confirm the date and location of death, and that allows us to open them up. So the register continues to grow, um, and every month there's new opportunities to find your ancestors. So now the register contains about, I think it's more than 35 million searchable records. If you've not used it before, amazing resource, packed with, um, uh, contextual information in uh, such as you know like in statistics on the local area information related to your ancestor's name all that kind of stuff and if you want to search the 39 register there is a link so we've got that uh, the record the military records I mentioned and the ones that have influenced this week's question of the week is we've added a further 24,000 additional records to our collection of a bit of a mouthful British Armed Forces First World War Soldiers Medical Records. These were records that we launched in association with the National Archives last year, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's for, I think I'm certain it was last year. Um, and they're a fascinating, fascinating collection of records. It contains both transcripts and images. <coughs> and basically, these records are part of the National Archives series MH106, probably doesn't mean anything, I'll give you the name. Water Office, First World War, Representative Medical Records of Servicemen. And the reason it's called Representative Medical Records of Servicemen is because not many survived, I believe. 
the ones that the National Archives do hold are only about 2% of what was ever taken. And despite many efforts to track down and trace um, the rest of them, these efforts have sadly proved um, fruitless, fruitless, is that the right word? Unsuccessful, uh, and they, have, they may be out there somewhere gathering dust in an attic or a storeroom, who knows, hopefully one day they will turn up. So this is only a selection of what survived, but there is a full representation of all the different kinds of medical records that were created during the war. Um, they include things like admissions and discharge records from hospitals, records relating to field ambulances, casualty clearing stations. You'll find records from big famous military hospitals like the Queen Alexandra Military Hospital. Um, and some of those ones from the Queen Alexandra Military Hospital actually predate the First World War. They date from 1910. Um, and if you go to the search page, which I will share with you now, you will find a full list all the hospitals and institutions and areas that are covered by these records. But anyway, why were they created? They were created by the Medical Research Committee during um, the First World War, and they were given over to the British Museum, um, which is why we thankfully have at least a slice of them. Uh, and they were basically used for statistical research, because in 1931, a chap called John Mitchell uh, and another chap called G.M. Smith published the history of the Great War based on official documents, um, medical services, casualties, and medical statistics of the Great War. They really had some very long titles back then, didn't they? And the statistics that were in that book were, were, were gathered from the data in these military records. So um, they will tell you quite a lot if you're lucky enough to find your ancestor in there, as well as finding out details related to their injuries. Their, you'll get service details like their rank, service number, very, very useful for tracking down service records. You'll get things like the admission date to whatever hospital or clearing station they were sent to. If they died, you'll find out when. You'll find uh, a description of their wounds. You might even find information about um, how they, how the circumstances surrounding the wound they received or the disease they incurred. You will find other notes and observations. You'll find, yeah, very, very rich. Um, and when you consider some of the horrific, horrific, horrific wounds, you know, the First World War was really an artillery war. Obviously, many men were killed by rifle fire, gas attacks, the dreaded bayonet. But the First World War was an artillery war, and artillery did terrible, terrible, terrible things to the human body. Um, and you will see that in gory detail in these records. So even if you don't have an ancestor in there, definitely worth checking if you have an interest, because... Yeah, sobering reading, and uh, it, will, it will tell you, yeah, it, it sheds a light on the dreadful, dreadful conditions those men faced. Anyway, what else have we added? So it's not just those. Uh, if, you're ans if you're watching from the United States, I hope you are. We, we welcome people from all over the world here. Um, we have released a new collection. I don't think it's brand new online, but it's certainly new to us, which is very big. Uh, the first phase of our United States National Veterans Cemetery Index. More, uh, more phases will come, but in this first phase, we've added over 1.8 million records. These are transcript only, uh, and it covers a century of veterans who fought in various conflicts from the American Civil War, the two, two World Wars, right up to the recent war in Afghanistan. Um, and again, each result will give you loads of different information about their life. It might give you family the names of other family members, uh, as well as birth years, hometowns. Yeah. The, fantastic way of, of finding your American military ancestors and the National Cemeteries, national, the, the National Cemeteries Cemetery Charity or I don't even know if initiative is an amazing initiative. Any Anyone who uh, fought in one of the many conflicts that America's been involved in over the in past years has the right to be buried in the, these cemeteries and their, their relatives can be buried there as well if they apply. Um, it's a great organisation that does great work. Um, and you can check out their website. So yeah, that's what we've added this week. Not to mention loads of new newspapers. Uh, and if you want to know more, again, as I said, visit the blog. You will find links to the newspapers we've added, as well as the dates that we have updated. Great. So that's the records out of the way. Oh, is sound breaking up a little bit? How is um? It could just be my cro croaky voice. I'll move my microphone right in front of my face. Um, right. Hopefully that's better. So we've got another story from Anya who said, uh, "My gran told me the other thing her father, uh, uh, other the only thing her father, the great grandfather with the military tribunal, spoke about was how he enjoyed looking after the horses, uh, all those horses as well. 
I'm wondering whether the reason she ended up giving up her dream of being a botanist and working in the bank was because of how the bank had supported her father during the First World War in his appeal. Wow, who knows? It could be. And that's another great example of, you know, sliding doors, all these connections that can influence later events. Um, very, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Oh, and hello, Mary. My colleague Mary has just joined. Nice to see you watching. But anyway, 1917, back to 1917. This is the bit I've been looking forward to telling you about. <clears throat> so I've told you what the film's about. And the reason I'm so excited to see this is because um, while there's been many, 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 many fantastic on-screen depictions of the Second World War, things like, um, oh, now I've said it, I'm forgetting, <laughs> uh, Saving Private Ryan, Dunkirk, Band of Brothers, which I think was probably one of the best TV series that have ever been made, Thin Red Line, oh, The Longest Day, A Bridge Too Far, the list is just too long to speak of. The First World War, I think, has been woefully underrepresented. Obviously, you had a lot of great films further back, things like All Quiet on the Western Front, the 1930s version, Sergeant York in 1941. You also had um, Paths to Glory, one of Kubrick's early films. Fantastic movie, brilliant. If you haven't watched it, do watch it. And of course, we did have War Horse quite recently, but I don't really count that because it's, I, it's, based, it's based on a kid's book. And while it's a great film, it, I don't know, I don't know. That, but anyway, uh, obviously we did have Peter Jackson's Amazing They Shall Not Grow Old, uh, which came out last year. And if, if you haven't watched that, please do. I mean, it's one of the most remarkable things I've seen over the past five, well, probably in my life, actually. That first instant where it pops from black and white into colour. and you, Yeah, don't want to spoil it, but it's great. Watch it. But yeah, this looks like one of the first big budget um, explorations of the First World War in modern cinema and for that reason i'm incredibly incredibly excited i briefly described the plot earlier as you said it's about as i said two british soldiers lance corporal schofield and blake given a, a near suicidal mission to deliver an imperative message during the german retreat to the hindenburg line in april 1917. so while the film is based on real events the characters um are not real individuals um but they they really did they really did do a lot of research. There's some fantastic interviews with Mendes himself uh, and Kirsty Wilson Cairns, who helped him write the script. And as I said, it was inspired by fragments of the stories from Mendes's grandfather's life, who served as a runner uh, on the Western Front. Uh, and Lance Corporate, his name was Lance Corporal Alfred H. Mendes. We found him in our collection of British Army service records. Um, as with many World War One soldiers, he, he seemed he was rather short five foot four inches only 19 years old um and he did an incredible feat of bravery sprinting across no man's land and that was what inspired mendez to write this film and i'll tell you a little bit about Mel Ma uh, alfred mendez's war in a second but anyway the accuracy so i've been i've been following this with great interest because i love historical movies and as you can imagine i'm pretty big on accuracy i'm a stickler for it i don't let it suck the joy out but I, when I do spot things that don't look right, it can completely break the immersion. So I'm really keen to see how this is done. But uh, they went to great effort. They dug 2,005 feet, 2,500 feet of trenches um, in the countryside of southwestern England, like one of our other viewers mentioned before, uh, for the set. And obviously trenches were a defining characteristic of the war on the Western Front. Um, so... It's no surprise, but 2,500 feet of them, that's incredible. So they brought on a British Army veteran as well, who's, who's called Paul Biddis, uh, and he served as the film's military technical advisor. Uh, and he actually himself had three relatives who served. And apparently Mendez encouraged all the cast to dig into their own roots and see what they could find. But what Biddis also did, I read this in an interview, was that he dug out uh, original British Army military instruction manuals to create a boot camp to give the soldiers a real authentic feeling of what it would have been like. He also used a load of books, ones he mentions are Max Arthur's Lest We Forget, Forgotten Voices from 1914 to 1945, which I haven't read, and Richard Van Emden's The Last Fighting Tommy, The Life of Harry Patch, The Last Veteran of the Trenches, which I have read, and have read sorry, which was written in conjunction with Patch, and Patch himself, and it's a fantastic book. Again, I will recommend it. If I remember, I will post links to these books 
in the comments afterwards. But the, the, even the extras didn't escape. All the extras were put hard to work. They were given about what three dozen tasks that were genuine parts of soldiers' daily routines. Some would have to attend to health in, in issues, like they'd have to do, conduct authentic foot inspections or use a candle to kill lice. I don't know whether the lice are authentic, but certainly the act of candle killing was. Um, others did trench maintenance, others filled sandbags. The leisure activities were very limited. They weren't allowed to, you know, play games on their phones. They were encouraged to play checkers or chess using buttons as game pieces rather than actual pieces. The commitment to authenticity is incredible. That's why I'm so excited to see this. Um, and there was a lot of waiting around. So being an, because they, they really want, Bidis was, was keen to capture the boredom that was a defining characteristic of many soldiers' wars. Uh, there was a lot of time spent waiting around between behind the lines soldiers often describe uh that the war was a real contrast between moments of intense action where you thought you were going to die at any moment to moments of incredible boredom there was nothing to do but sit around and reflect on the situation you found yourself in um sorry i see people keep commenting i'm going to check on the comments in a second but i just love seeing you all um talk to each other um hi sylvia glad you're here hello angela glad you're here too and hello jim uh, Jim Kimpton, who said, my grandfather joined in January 1916 as a bugle boy, age 16. Wow. Was uh, field promoted from that to Lance Corporal. The two main characters of the film are also Lance Corporals. Uh, and finally to Sergeant when he was shot through the right hand. And so it was discharged home in August 1918. Uh, he was lying on his sofa at home recovering on the 11th of November 1918. Wow. Unfortunately, he was too, to be at home on his sofa. But what an, wow, what an, that's, a, that's another fantastic story. Every story from from the First World War is incredible, isn't it? I mean, we just can't comprehend uh, what it must have been like experiencing that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so back to the movie. Um, as I said, the movie is, I need to stop saying as I said, I repeat that so many times. Uh, the movie is based on Schofield and uh, Blake who have to deliver this message and messengers were, as I said, were, as I said, messengers were a big part of the war. Um, there's a little bit of creative license coming in in the film because traditionally runners didn't really cover the distances depicted in the film um, and the order given to Blake and Schofield would have been too dangerous an assignment to actually probably ever be given. Um, runners were only sent out if there was a realistic prospect of them actually making it to the other side. Um, but even then, the risk of death was very, very, very high. So high, in fact, they were sent out in pairs, as Blake and Schofield are in the film. Logic behind that's pretty obvious. If something happens to one of them, the other could finish the job. Um, and of course, in some places, they didn't have far to go. Um, no man's land could be as... The distance between trenches could be as little as 15 yards. In others, it could be, as, it could be up to a mile away. Um, and don't forget, the muddy terrain that they had to cross was, was littered with dead animals, dead humans, barbed wire, unexploded ordnance, craters from exploding shells, pretty much no grass or trees in sight. So apart from shell, hole, shell holes, we were pretty limited in terms of cover. I mean, maybe a dying, a dead horse or cow or something you could cow behind. Um, so yeah, if you, if you didn't get out of your trench, if you, by 1917 basically, you didn't get out of your trench and go across no man's land. You just didn't do it unless there was a real imperative to do so. Fire from artillery, machine guns, poisonous gas. It was just too heavy. Technology had progressed quite quickly by 1917 from 1914. Both sides had got very, very good at killing each other. Um, and the weapons being used were very dangerous, inconsiderate uh, and horrific. Uh, and for that reason, human messages Pigeons, we all know messenger pigeons were a big part of the war. They were deployed very regularly. But for those reasons, human messages like Blake and Schofield were only deployed in the most desperate of situations. That was when uh, field telephones, radios, when they couldn't be used, when there was no, when, when it, the pigeons weren't available or they were guaranteed to be shot out the sky as soon as they got it set up. They were only used in the direst of situations. 
Um, and yeah, when you think that there are about three, five, 35,000 miles of trenches on the Western Front, all zigzagging, all mixed up and confused, um, is incredible when you think that the Western Front itself was only 430 miles long. So in four, across 430 miles of front, there was 35,000 miles of trenches extending from the English Channel in the north all the way to the Swiss Alps in the south. So, yeah, not a nice place. Uh, but what was going on in April 1916 when the film is set? So the film is set on April the 6th. Um, and basically what it's inspired by is an operation called Operation Abo Alberich. Um, I tried to do a little bit of German pronunciation there, but you all know my pronunciations are terrible, so I won't. Operation Alberich. Uh, and it had actually just ended by April 6th. It ended on April the 5th. Um, but that's very much what inspired the events of the film. So what happened? Basically, from February the 23rd to the April the 5th of 1917, the Germans were moving hundreds of thousands of troops back to the Hindenburg Line um, along the Asin, 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 I can't pronounce it, that river, the Asin River. Um, and this basically cleared a, an area of about 20, 27 miles from Arras to Papalm. Uh, and that left a lot of empty territory. And the significance of this tactical withdrawal depends on who you're getting the accounts from. Uh, the Germans referred to it as an adjustment. Obviously, propaganda and, 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 and stiff upper lips were a big thing back then. Uh, they, based, they claimed they were simply moving needed resources to the best location, while the Allies, of course, called it a retreat or a withdrawal and viewed it as a very positive sign. But in either case, this withdrawal in 1917 basically triggered, saw in the, it heralded the arrival of a whole new phase of the war that was just about to begin um, for a different reason as well. The Americans had just entered the war. On April the 6th, 1917, the United States joined and it was clear to the Germans and the Allies the end was now in sight. A few days after this as well, the Canadians captured Beamy Ridge. Um, obviously, this is a battle that was hu hugely significant in Canada. It was, it was referred to as the birth of a nation uh, as one, by one of their generals. And further east, the Russian Revolution was also ramping up. And this is, so it was the beginning of the end, really. Obviously, there was still a lot of terrible, heavy fighting to go on. Um, the Germans launched, still gambled with their, they weren't out the game yet. They still had enough resources to launch their 100 days offensive in 1918. Um, but the end was in sight. Uh, so while they were pulling out from this area, when they began on 19th, 9th of February 1917, they did do a real scorched earth policy. They didn't want to leave anything for the Allies. They dug up roads and railways, they felled trees, they polluted water wells, they evacuated towns, villages were destroyed, and a large number of landmines and other booby traps were planted all over this 27-mile region of French countryside. And while I haven't seen it yet, this is apparently depicted in the film, and you can get a sense of that from the trailer. A lot of the areas they're running through do look like ghost towns. And while this happened, British forces moving into these rare areas were quite surprised to find vast stretches of German trenches completely abandoned, French villages completely cleared out, and this eerie kind of abandoned apocalyptic wasteland is the setting of the film. Um, and apparently as well booby traps uh, are featured as well. Um, so while they were doing all this, they also, the Germans also evacuated 125,000 able-bodied French civilians out of the region to work elsewhere in occupied France to help them with their war effort. This wasn't voluntary, it was compulsory. They were rounded up and forcefully transferred, leaving children, mothers and the elderly behind with minimal rations. And starvation, sadly, did kill many of those who were left behind. And again, I haven't seen it, but I do believe there is a section of the film that does depict some of the French civilians who were left behind while the husbands, um, well, the men have been sent off to work for the Germans in other parts of France. Uh, and this did have a pretty big impact. By evacuating this, um, the German front was short by basically the evac. The Germans, by in doing this, cleared two salients, the Nyon and the Baupalm salients. And this was big for them. It basically shortened their front by 25 miles, 40 kilometres, however you want to say it. And that meant that 14 fewer German divisions were needed to hold the line. 
And by this stage of the war, the Germans had lost a lot of men. Those 14 divisions that were spared were, were desperately needed elsewhere. And the Allied plans um, for that spring were seriously disrupted because they didn't know this was coming. Came out the blue, they were completely shocked. All the lines were moved, all the plans they'd made had to be abandoned and withdraw withdrawn. Uh, while it was viewed as a propaganda disaster for Germany, because obviously the Allies pounced on the scorched earth policy they'd used and used it across, you can see it in the newspapers. Have a look at our newspaper archive and you will find lots about it, railing against the horrors committed by, the atrocities committed by German forces in this region of France. Um, so yeah, it was a pro propaganda disaster for them, but many historians now think that it may have been one of the shrewdest defensive operations of the war. So there you go. That was a, a little slice of World War I history I didn't know, and I think it's good to, um, to go in to see the film, knowing this, and it can, I, I'm hoping when I go in, I can be like, ah, I know what's going on there, and hopefully you will too. Um, oh, Rosie Murrell, Drat forgot it's Friday. That doesn't matter, you're here, and that's all that matters. Um, so we had another look at the comments. Leslie Norris, who said, our relative joined up at 15 years, three months. Whoa, that's young. He was killed in action before his 18th birthday at Arras. Arras was a bad one. Uh, well, they were all bad ones, but Arras is up there, isn't it? It was one of the very famous horrific battles of the war. There were no family on the Commonwealth War Games Commission site. I had to send census and certificates for his birth and parents and marriage before they would add his record. Wow. Well, well done, Leslie. That's that's an incredible thing you did. And that means that now his sacrifices will permanently be commemorated and stored. And, and, and yeah, that, that's brilliant. I didn't even know you could do that. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, Nicole Hassel, another one of our regular viewers. Nice to see you, Nicole. I said, my great-grandfather was in World War II, but I think his records were one of those that had been destroyed. That's World War I, Nicole. Uh, the, the World War II records are still held by the Ministry of Defence. And if you want to get them, you've got to write the MOD. But as a next of kin, you should have no problem getting hold of them. It will take a bit of a while, a little bit of a cost involved, but you will get, uh, you will get them eventually. Uh, Heidi, to the hike. I just saw that. Um, so Chairman Nicholson said, found out I have uh, a half brother. Wow, found out that I have a half brother. His mother-in-law found my father, our father, while doing his family tree. That's fantastic to hear. I, have you connected yet? Are you going to connect? Um, that's one of the great unexpected outcomes of family history, I guess. Not only does it enrich your understanding of, of your family and your past, it can lead to new connections and new family relations. I always love hearing that. Um, and as Anya said, yeah, that seems to be becoming more of a discussion with DNA covering things that paperwork perhaps haven't. And it's going to happen even more. We're living in very interesting times. Um, and Sylvia, my pal Sylvia, another regular viewer, said, the other grandfather has such a common surname that I will never find anything unless his medals turn up. I polished them as a child, but after my mother's death, my uncle demanded them back. And, oh, no, that's sad. And now they are lost. Well, thank you to everybody who keeps sending these comments in. I do enjoy reading them, and uh, it's fantastic to see. Uh, and if anyone's just tuning in, um, hello, um, thank you for joining. We are discussing the history behind 1917. I just did a little bit of context setting. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the story of Alfred Mendes, uh, Sam Mendes' great-grandfather, the man who inspired the film and who did an incredible act of bravery, who won the military medal. Then we'll take a quick look at um, some of the real runners who won the Victoria Cross for doing actions very similar to those depicted in the film. And last but not least, depending on how we do for time, we will see what I've found out after looking at Colin Firth's family tree. So, Alfred Mendes, who was he, apart from being... Um, Sam Mendez's great grandfather. Full name, Alfred Hubert Mendez, military medal, uh, was also quite a well known novelist and short story writer. He was actually a leading member of this 1930s literary group called the Beacon Group um, in Trinidad and Tobago, which included a load of famous writers from that era um, and were basically some of the first writers to, to basically 
write fiction about what life was like in the West Indies. I haven't read any of his books, but I, I will certainly have to dig them out. But the one I do want to read was that Alfred Hubert Mendes published his own very, very detailed memoir, memoirs. I believe you can buy them online. I think it's available on Google Books. I cannot remember the name. But in it, he describes his First World War experiences in detail. And that is how Sam Mendes was fortunate enough to be able to learn lots about his ancestors' war. So, um, and I've actually been able to dig out a few excerpts so we can hear what Alfie, as he liked to be known, uh, what Alfie's experiences were like. So as I said, he was born in Trinidad in 1897, uh, and he was the eldest of six children. Uh, they were a Portuguese Creole family, <coughs> um, and he was, the family were pretty well to do. Uh, he was educated in private schools, in various private schools in Trinidad until he was about 15, uh, when he was sent to England to attend a boarding school in Hertfordshire. Uh, he wrote that he didn't suffer a single pang of home homesickness, but loved, reveled in this new way of life uh, and finding himself in the English countryside. He also described himself as a naturally shy creature. Again, as, as I said earlier, he was, I've got to stop as I saying, as I said earlier, as I said before, slight variation, he was just a little over five foot six inches. Um, so not very tall. Um, and he'd also wondered how his life would have turned out. He says this in his autobiography, if he'd been given the chance to have attend university in England, that had always been his attention. But when war broke out on July the 28th, 1914, as with millions of young men of that generation, his plans were disrupted and he never got the chance. Um, his father, a prominent businessman, when he found out that war had been declared, he desperately wanted Alfred to return to, in, to Trinidad, probably because he didn't want his son being shipped off to war. But Alfred managed to stay in school and became determined to fight. He got caught up in that great wave of patriotic, patriotic fervour uh, and was desperate to do his bit, as so many young men were. Um, he... Um, did briefly return to Trinidad, but soon enlisted behind his father's back. Again, that is a very common story. Many, many, um, many young men lied about their ages, hid joining up from their parents. While, very, while many people believed the war would be over by Christmas and were caught up in the jingoism of it all, others were, others realised it was still a war um, and knew that it would lead to bloodshed and horror and they didn't want their children being caught up in that. Uh, but Alfred was determined, and as I said, he lied, <laughs> he lied, uh, and he wrote in his memoirs, um, those young men who wished to serve in the war for king and country, I was one of them, uh, and found himself on a boat back to England. But he went into a bit more detail, he said, I think I know why I wanted to go to war. My insatiable curiosity, history had proved war to be a fact of life, therefore I must savour it. And always at the back of my mind lurked the suspicion that in order to write novels, one must truly live. I could not know that such talent as I had would fall far short of my aspirations and my dreams. So as well as wanting to do his bit, it seems that part of his inspiration was to learn more about life and become a better writer. So in late 1915, he was able to get back to England and join the ranks of the King's Royal Rifle Corps. He was quickly deployed to France, uh, where he was placed in the 1st Battalion of the Rifle Brigade. And in May 1916, he got his first taste of real combat when he reached an area called Abbeville, uh, in an uh, area of France that is now infamous, particularly at that time in 1916. That region was the Somme. So, yeah, he saw action in the, that part of the Somme, but... The events that led to him winning the military medal uh, happened later, about a year later. Um, he'd already spent a year in the trenches, and by this time he'd been sent off to fight in the Third Battle of the Ypres, uh, or Ypres, known, also known by some as the Battle of Passchendaele, well, which doesn't need any introductions. It was a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful battle, and the loss of life was intense. Uh, and he wrote about it, he describes it. He said, the Ypres salient was a marsh of mud and a killer of men. Walking from Popper Ridge, uh, Popper Ridge to the salient, an area which countless men, the flowers of Britain and Germany, lost their lives, an area to which countless shells plunged, destroying whatever trees, plant, bush or grass there was left, um, or grass there was left behind a moon-like desolation. Many shell craters as traps for sucking in live men and drowning them. To this sector we came in October 1917. 
Um, so during this battle, his unit was sent to capture a uh, in, in, important village, a village called Polkapel, which straddled a ridge that was very strategically important, and the Germans knew this. What made matters worse was that rain, it had rained pretty much all October, and the ground and the conditions were terrible, making the soldiers were truly exhausted having to fight their way through this sucking clay-like mud. So by the, before they, the battle had even started, these men were exhausted. As they approached Polkapel, the Germans began raining down a ferocious barrage of shell fire, machine gun fire, sniper fire, and Mendes himself described it as a massacre. So um, he, and, he and the men that hadn't already been killed found themselves clinging to the ground, bellies to the earth, desperately trying not to get killed. Um, so they're in a dead stop. And this, this was before the battle had even really begun in earnest. So by 9.30 a.m., uh, a message reached his, com captain, uh, his commanding officer, a man named Captain Craig, Craig Milley. Um, and basically the report, the, the, the re report was that four companies were spread out and they 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 desperately needed to know what was going on so they can consolidate their efforts and push forward someone needed to deliver this message a very very dangerous assignment indeed mendez who had actually undergone a little bit of signaling training which wasn't really related to this task felt that he had to volunteer and put his hand up for this incredibly dangerous task so he sat off and he writes the snipers got wind of me and their individual bullets were soon seeking out until I came to the comforting conclusion that they were so nonplussed at seeing a lone man wandering in circles about no man's land, as must at the time have been the case, that they decided, out of perhaps a secret admiration for my nonchalance, to dispatch their bullets safely out of my way. Or they may, to, may, may have thought that I was just plain crazy. Miraculously, he was not hit and he was able to deliver his message. Um, and for this bravery, he was awarded a military medal. His citation read, on October the 12th, he actually wrote uh, in his, um, he wrote in his memoirs, somewhat, he described it as somewhat flattering, I think. Uh, but he wrote, on October the 12th and 13th, 1917, this man acted as company runner during the fighting around Pole Capel. He belonged to the right company that formed part of the defensive flank. For the whole of the, these two days, he was continually on the move from company headquarters to platoon and battalion advance report center at Fairden House, and this in spite of continuous machine gun and sniping fire from the flank. It was largely due to his coolness and complete disregard for his personal safety that his commanding officer was kept informed of the state of affairs on that important flank. His activity and the unretiring en energy under the worst possible conditions of ground and weather was remarkable. He set a fine example of devotion to duty of every soldierly quality. There you go. As, as, as Meadows said, that is praise indeed. And before we take a look at some of the real runners of the First World War, like Alfred Mendez, because he was one of few, uh, one of many, sorry, uh, I want to share with you a blog post that my, my colleague Niall lovingly crafted. So I can see by a lot of the comments we've already had that um, people have already dug into their First World War ancestors' stories. If you haven't, read this blog to find out more. We'll give you all the information hopefully need to get started. So back to runners. I probably won't go through all five because it's already 10 to 6 and I did promise you we'd take a sneak peek at Colin Firth's family tree. Anyway, <clears throat> the real runners of World War I, as we said, as we talked about earlier, uh, they were real, uh, they were used as a last resort uh, but they would often be clear they'd often go in pairs as well in case one was killed the other could carry on and they would be clearly identifiable by the red armbands that it would fix around their left forearm so runners could be drawn from pretty much any background they could be from a specialized background or an everyday background they could just simply be a man in the regiment who was in the wrong place at the wrong time who was given this task or someone who simply popped their hand up and volunteered so he could save his pals um, and their function was not simply to bear messages from one area of command to another, um, but this was the main one, really. Um, more critically, and this isn't touched on as much, but more critically in requiring complete specialisation, qualified runners would be expected to have to really, really closely familiarise themselves with the areas of the front line into which their battalion 
was going to enter. Obviously, it was very important that they knew their way around across this 3,000, was it 3,500 miles of trenches I said earlier? I can't remember the exact figure, but obviously these zigzags of trenches, they needed to know it intricately so they could get quickly from point A to B. Um, as well as not being, as well as keeping alive, being imperative, speed was of the essence as well. So as they were expected to develop this really specialised knowledge, they were also often expected to guide newly arriving troops into the trenches from behind the lines into the lines um, with accuracy. Uh, and this was often a very difficult role because a lot of the time this was done under cover of darkness so the new arriving troops couldn't be shelled. Uh, or spotted by spotter planes. So these guys really needed to know their way around. It was a very dangerous job. They'd have to excel at both map reading and reconnaissance, as well as being incredibly fit. Um, and in some cases, they wouldn't just work in pairs. Sometimes there'd be eight, as many as eight, working on the same task at various parts of the line. Uh, very, very, de yeah, oh, I, can't, I can't imagine doing that as a job. I mean, coincidentally, Adolf Hitler was actually a runner during the First World War. Adolf Hitler won the Bavaria, uh, won the Iron Cross and Clasp for delivering messages during his time in the Bavarian army. Um, yeah, just a little bit of a historical side note that I thought could be interesting. Um, we touched on this earlier, but the reasons they were used, just in case you're tuning in again, uh, communications at the time were in their infancy and they were not very reliable. Trench, telepho um, trench telephones, radios, often failed, uh, battle lines were incredibly long, attackers, attack and defenders were often very, very spread out, which could mean communication was very difficult. And when, when things hit the fan, so to speak, it could go south very, very fast. Communication could just be completely obliterated and confusion, confusion was a big killer. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, here are some of the real, um, runners of the First World War, and I will post some links to their Victoria Cross records that you can actually see. Oh, Karen Harvey, anyone know of any sources from World War I prisoners of war? Funny you should ask that, because uh, we have <laughs> we have them. So but let me just get a link for you. Find my past prisoners of war. This is a fantastic collection. It doesn't just cover the First World War, it covers the second and many more. It dates all the way back to 1715. Uh, and I will pop a link in the comments for you now. So if you're looking for a World War Prisoner of War, Karen, this is where you want to be doing it. I really hope that helps. Ah, on your saying blog posts don't seem to show in the comment feed, but they are there if you if they are there if you go back and look at the end of the live video. Yeah, so I don't know why that happens. I'll see if I can get a fix on it. For some reason, when I post them, you can't see them, but I am posting them. So as soon as I've ended this, if you go have a look in the comments, you should find all the blogs that I have been posting for you not just the blogs, uh, the record links as well. Ah, thank you, Cindy, for clearing that up as well. Must be a weird Facebook thing. I will look into that and see if I can correct it for next week. Um, anyway, real runners. So as uh, our quick, quick plug of our illustrated Victoria Cross records. These are part of our wider collection of um, medal index cards. They're Br British Army calendar. Campaign, Gallantry and Long Service Awards, I think we call it. Quite a mouthful, um, which I can also grab a link for you now, just in case you need. You won't see it now, but when I uh, hang up, so to speak, you will see it. Let's get the link for you now. So I'm posting now that you won't be able to see a link to our medal index record. Um, yeah, so the first one we have is a chap called Private James Miller. So James Miller was a Whitnall paper mill worker who was born in Horton um, in 1819. And he was one of, a very working class lad, very, very hard life. He was one of 15 children born to a labourer called George Miller and his wife Mary. Um, and it's clear that they, his childhood was a very poor, tough one because while he was one of 15 siblings, only 10 of them reached adulthood. Five of his siblings died in infancy, which is terribly sad, but was not uncommon in the Edwardian era. Uh, in September 1915, James enlisted in Blackburn, uh, was sent to France in early July 1915. He had a 
rough time of it, as pretty much all of them did, and he soon saw action at Lens and Lewes in the autumn. And then his battalion was moved to the Somme in April 1916, uh, where he saw action at La Boisselle, which was another nasty battle. Um, and then apparently when he, he came home after this and during his last leave, he told his sister <coughs> that he was convinced she would never see him again. He didn't think he'd survive the war, but all he hoped, he didn't hope to survive. He simply hoped that he would die a hero, which is, well, hits you in the chest that, doesn't it? Um, and on the night of the, of the 31st of July, at a place called Bazent in La Petite, uh, on the Somme, James had his chance to tragically die as a hero. Uh, the Germans began a desperate counter of fan attack and Miller was delivered, well, Miller delivered his final ever message. So the London Gazette records his act of gallantry as, as, thus, as such. Uh, for, most for most conspicuous bravery, his battalion was consolidating a position after its capture by assault. Private Miller was ordered to take an important message under heavy shell and rifle fire and to bring, it, bring back a reply at all cost. He was compelled to cross the open and on leaving the trench was shot almost immediately in the back, the bullet coming through his abdomen. In spite of this, with heroic courage and self-sacrifice, he compressed the gaping wound in his abdomen delivered his message, staggered back with his answer and fell dead at the feet of the officer to whom he delivered it. He gave his life with a supreme devotion to duty. Poor James was just 26 years old when he did that and he was laid to rest in Dartmoor Cemetery in France. Yeah, what a sad story uh, and one we should remember. Another very brave man, just like James, was Major Robert Edward Cruikshank. Cruikshag was actually a Canadian. He was born in Winnipeg in 1888. He was the first of five children born to a Scottish father and the family moved back to England in 1903. Again, Robert had a tough start in life. When he was very young, his, his younger brother, John, was tragically killed after falling from a moving tram in 1913. Um, then his middle brother, Percy, volunteered to join the army and was killed while serving with the Royal Fusiliers. 1917, age just 19. Uh, but anyway, more on Robert anyway. So after leaving school, Robert worked, he worked as a, uh, a travelling salesman uh, and he served in the City of London Yeoman Riders volunteer unit between 1908 and 1911. So he was already a semi-professional soldier when war was declared. Uh, he initially volunteered for the Royal Flying Corps but soon transferred to the London Scottish Regiment um, and after training, he was sent to the 1st Battalion in France and he was wounded at the Battle of the Somme in September 1916, evacuated back to England. But after recovering, he was posted back, <laughs> he was posted to the 2nd Battalion and then sent to Salonika. where there was some very, very heavy fighting. That's a, a theatre of the war that isn't discussed as much as the Western Front, but there was some serious fighting around Salonika. Uh, and, then prior, and then after that, he embarked to Egypt. And it was while he was battling Turkish forces east of the River, River Jordan on the 1st of May 1918 that he won his Victoria Cross. Uh, and he was aged 29 years old when he did this. And rather than describing it to you, I will read the actual citation from the War Office because I think that's probably the best way of summing it up. So the War Office said, the platoon to which Private Cruikshank belonged came under heavy fire uh, with rifles and machine gun at short range and was led down a steep bank into a wadi most of the men being hit before they be reached the bottom. Immediately after reaching the bottom of the wadi, the officer in command was shot dead. And the sergeant who then took over command said to run about to company headquarters asking for support, but was mortally wounded almost immediately after. The corporal, having in the meantime been killed, the only remaining NCO, a lance corporal, believed the first messenger to be have killed, believing the first messenger to have, to be have to have been killed, called for a volunteer to take the second message back. Private Cruikshank immediately responded, despite knowing that the first messenger had been killed and seeing all his comrades being shot left, right and centre of him, he knew that leaving the wadi could mean certain death. Anyway, back to the citation. Private Cruikshank immediately responded and rushed up the slope that was hit and rolled back into the wadi bottom. He again rose and rushed up the slope, but being again ro wounded, rolled back again into the wadi. After his, wounds, after his wounds had been dressed, he rushed a third time up the slope and again fell badly wounded. Being now unable to stand, he rolled himself back amid a hail of bullets. 
His wounds were now such of a nature as to preclude him making any further attempt. And he lay all day in a dangerous position, being sniped at. And again, he was wounded where he lay. He displayed the utmost valour and endurance and was, cheerfully and was cheerful and uncomplaining throughout. Wow, there you go. That man did not give up. Thankfully, he survived and was evacuated back to London. Uh, was it not London, sorry, back to England, where he recovered from his wounds. He, for, as you can expect, he was received as a hero and received his VC at the at Buckingham Palace on the 24th of October, 1918. Uh, during the Second World War, his devotion to duty didn't die. And while too old to serve in, in the military, he served as a major in the Home Guard and passed away aged 73 in 1961. Um, and do you know what? I won't do the full five. I will post a link to the blog post that we wrote on this. So you can read them yourself after this. But I'll do one more because this is another sad one and another story that deserves to be told. Oh, I can see some great comments. I want to look at those. Um, right. So this is the story of a very, 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 very brave man called Lieutenant Alfred Robert Wilkinson. So Wilkinson was born in Lee. In December 1896, um, he, after finishing his education at St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Day School, we quick plug to our collection of national schools and mission registers, that's where he can be found. He worked as a pizza at the Mather Lane Mill, uh, where his father had worked before him as a spinner, so following his father into, 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 work, into the trade, I guess. Uh, he, when war was declared, again, very patriotic, he volunteered in the Royal Scots Greys at the outbreak of war. Uh, but transferred the following year into the 2nd Battalion of the Seaforth Highlanders. Finally, Alfred enlisted in the, uh, the 5th Manchester Regiment, and that's when he was sent to France in 1916, where he took part in a number of very hairy and serious engagements, but escaped without a scratch, which was very lucky. So in autumn of 1916, he went over the top at Fleurs, near Bapalme, uh, and fought the entire Somme campaign without receiving a scratch, which when you think that nearly 60,000 men were killed on the same day, uh, that's incredible. What are the odds? Um, he then fought at Arras, the Third Battle of Ypres, and the Second Battle of the Somme. So he really did, according, you know, in the language of the day, he had a rough time of it. Uh, and his division, the 42nd, were billeted near Peron, where they were resting a few miles home from the firing line, when the final German offensive, the big German 100 days offensive, started on the 21st of March 1918. Uh, and this is the offensive that's actually uh, the setting for the film and the play by R.C. Sheriff, Journey's End. Very good play and very, very good film too. Uh, so Alfred was 22 years old when he won his VC. Uh, and his citation read, for most conspicuous for most conspicuous bravery and, bravery and devotion to duty, on the 20th of, 20th of October 1918, during the attack on Maru, uh, when four runners in succession, having been killed in an endeavour to deliver a message to the supporting company, Private Wilkinson volunteered for the duty. He succeeded, succeeded in delivering the message, through the, though the journey involved exposure to extremely heavy machine gun and shell fire for 600 yards. He showed magnificent courage and complete indifference to danger, thinking only of the needs of his company and entirely disregarding any consideration for personal safety. Throughout the remainder of the day, Private Wilkinson continued to do splendid work. After this, he survived the war. Uh, he eventually got a field commission and was raised to the rank of lieutenant. And then after the war, returned uh, home where he ran a sweet shop with his wife for a short time. That was before he took up another job as a tester at the local coal mine. Sadly, a decision that would result in his death. Uh, he was a soldier till the end, though. So just like, um, just like the soldier, be, just just like the soldier before him, um, he volunteered for the Home Guard during the Second World War. Uh, where and while he. Well, sorry, while he served in the Home Guard, he also volunteered to fight in the Pioneer Corps. Um, he actually applied to join in 1939, but he was a very advanced age for considering how old most soldiers were. So he didn't know whether his application would be accepted. Sadly, just days after receiving confirmation that he had been accepted to, to, to join the Pioneer Corps and serve in the Second World War, uh, he was killed in a mining disaster at Bickershaw Colliery. Uh, he was killed by poisonous gas during a mine collapse. And this was just days after receiving the news he'd been waiting for, that he was eligible to fight in Pioneer Corps. 
amazing stories and very, very sad ones, but ones we should share and remember. And as promised, as soon as I end this broadcast, I will pop links to all these blog posts in the comments so you can read them at your leisure and uh, hopefully get a more uh, smooth account of things than the garbled one I've been giving you. Great, so as I've... Do I have time for Colin Firth? Yes, go on, we'll do a little bit, we'll do a little bit. I might touch on it next week uh, because Colin Firth's family tree is fascinating. He was, he, he is in the film. I mean, 1917 has some of the best British actors of this generation, I think. It's got Mark Strong, Andrew Scott, Richard Madden, Colin Firth, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, very, very good creme de la creme of, of British acting. Um, but Colin Firth is playing the character of General Aaron Moore, who sets the entire film's action into motion, I guess, when he gives Blake and Schofield the order to deliver this, to deliver this message across enemy lines to prevent the massacre during Operation Alderich. Um, and Colin Firth's family tree is fascinating. I probably don't have time to go through it in extent. Oh, who, do I, who am I kidding? Not in any rush. I'm going to do it anyway. So, yeah. <clears throat> Despite taking Italian citizenship in uh, 20, 2017 uh, through his Italian wife, Firth's roots are very much British and, well, English and Scottish. But while he has English and Scottish roots, our India office records have also proved, exclusive India office records, I may add, uh, has also proved that his family have a very strong connection to British India. And without showing you the tree, I will do my best job at explaining this to you. Um, I hope it makes... Oh, Anita Moore, Colin Firth, my celebrity crush. I, uh, and Rich, uh, I see people also like Richard Madden. <laughs> uh, he is a fantastic actor. I don't think I've ever seen anything in him that I, anything with him in that I didn't enjoy. But very quickly, um, let's go through his family tree. <clears throat> so Firth was originally from Hampshire. He was born in Greyshot to Shirley Jean Rawls and David Nor Norman Lewis Firth. Uh, and he spent, his parents were academics, so he travelled a lot. He spent a bit of his childhood in Nigeria and St. Louis in the United States, but returned to the UK when he was about 14. And it was then that he decided he wanted to be an actor. And thankfully for us, he became one. Uh, so his paternal grandparents, Cyril Bruce Firth um, and... Uh, Mary Helen Bruce can be found in the 1939 register. And they show that Cyril Bruce Firth was a Yorkshireman born in Huddersfield and according to the 1939 register he worked as a confectioner. <coughs> His wife Mary, Mary Helen Bruce was the daughter of a Scotsman named Robert Bruce from Aberdeen and, uh, and Alice Briggs who was from also from Lancashire. So his uh, paternal roots very much in the northern half of the British Isles. Um, and it's here that we start to see a theme emerging, a pattern in his tree, and that is congregationalism. Uh, there was congregationalism on both sides of the family, and the families were very involved. Actually, there were min a lot of them were missionaries and ministers. So according to the 1871 census, Robert de Bruce from Aberdeen, that was a terrible accent, I'm very sorry, uh, was an independent Congregationalist minister for the Highland Chapel. Alice is simply noted down as minister's wife. But as we continue to go back, we see the ties to congreg Congregationalism appearing again and again and again. So Colin's paternal grandmother, Helen Mary Lewis, um, she was also the... Um, so the ones we were talking about then were his maternals. So his paternal grandmother, Mary Hellis, Helen, Helen Mary Lewis, also the daughter of a congregational congregate, congregationalist minister and his name was Edward Herbert Lewis and his wife was named Dora Catherine Slater um, and this is where it gets a bit confusing because there's lots of names and similar occupations so Helen so this is Colin's paternal um, grandmother Helen like her father was born in British India and she was born there in, Brit in June 1911 but when we look for her in our collection of India office birth and baptism records, we, really, we, we find details for her father, um, Edwin. And then when we search for Edwin, we can find that Edwin was born in 1871 in Balera, which back then was one of the biggest towns in 
what was then the Madras presidency. Um, and he was um, uh, a missionary. But then we also see that his father, also called Edwin, Edwin Senior, was also a missionary. So his, his father, Edwin Senior, and his wife, Elizabeth Lewis, had moved to India from Somerset, and they both worked there as missionaries. Again, so again, this it gets confusing again. So when we go back to, um, when we go back to Dora, so Dora is Edwin Junior's wife. Um, so this is not Edwin Senior, Ed, Dora. Dora's father, his name was Thomas Ebenezer Slater. He was also a missionary. Uh, and we can see that he was a missionary with the Independent Minister Society of London Missionaries. And he was born in Buckinghamshire in 1840. When we follow him across the records, we see he travelled all over the world, spreading the word of God. He he resided in India for a long time. Obviously, that's where a lot. Of, I think that's where Dora was born. Uh, but he died in uh, Goulburn, New South Wales, in 1920, 1912. So the man got about. Uh, and Thomas appears to have met his wife and Dora's mother, a lady called Janice Elizabeth Cole, after settling in, in India, because again, British India Office records show that Jane Elizabeth Cole was also was born in Madras in 1848, and she had her parents were named Joseph and Anne Cole. Joseph and Anne Cole, and can you guess what their occupations were? They were missionaries, Congregationalist missionaries. <laughs> um, so then we go back to his maternal grandfather. So, uh, so on his mother's side, his maternal grandfather was a chap called Montague John Rolls Rolls. It's a great name, isn't it? Uh, Montague John Rolls Rolls was born in Hampshire in 1908. Um, the 1939 register shows him living in Dorset with his wife Florence and lists his, occup lists his occupation as. Can you guess it? Can you guess what his occupation was? Give you a clue. A clue. It begins with M. Yeah, he was a missionary too. <laughs> a lot of missionaries. Um, and Montague's parents, I hope you're following this, but I will post a blog. I will post a link to the blog about this afterwards so you can read it in detail and hopefully make sense of what I've been telling you. Montague's parents were Montague Senior. So a lot. So we've got two sets of juniors and seniors in this family tree, all of whom are missionaries. So Montague Senior and Helen Jean Johnson. Um, so Montague Senior is the ancestor who connects Colin to the events of 1917. Uh, military records show that Montague Senior, was, uh, who was born in, in Corfe Mullet in Dorset in 1876, served as an airman during the earliest days of the Royal Air Force. And we have found him in our collection of British Royal Air Force Airmen's service records. And I will send you a link to that now. You won't be able to see now, but you will be able to see once the video is over. Put that in, hang on. Oh, let's get it in. That doesn't seem to work. There you go. So that's a link to the that's a link to the collection. Uh... <laughs> sorry, sorry, look, people, people comments making me laugh. Um, so Montague's War. So as I said, Montague Senior, who was uh, Colin's paternal great grandfather, the father of Colin's. No, Colin's maternal great grandfather. So this is the father of Colin's maternal grandfather, Montague John Rolls Rolls. So the Montague Rolls Montague Rolls Rolls Senior. So uh, we find him in his in these RAF records, uh, and we show. But the RAF records show that, like many airmen in the early days of the RAF, he actually joined the army first before he transferred, and this was very, very, very common. Um, airman service records are quite detailed. We can see that Montague's uh, career was a meat salesman. We also get a physical description for him. We see that he was five foot three and a half inches, even shorter than Alfred Mendes. Um, and he had brown hair, grey eyes, and a fresh complexion. So maybe a little bit of a resemblance to um, Hugh, uh, not Hugh, um, Colin. Given his age, uh, he was quite old by the time he volunteered. He would have been just, just over 40. And when I say quite old, I don't mean old. I mean old by the standards of... Uh, um, old by army standards, if you know what I mean. We think the average age was probably about 18, 19. Not many soldiers were in their 40s. But this gives us a clue. This means that Montague would have either been conscripted once restrictions had been relaxed, or he would have volunteered under the Derby scheme in 1915. I, I think you know what the Derby scheme was, but if you don't, it was a scheme that was launched by the Earl of Derby in 1915, the autumn of 1915, and the Earl of Derby was Lord Kitchener's new Director General of Recruiting, and it basically aimed to increase 
recruitment before they had to resort to conscription. Uh, and what it did was it meant that men could volunteer but not join the forces straight away. It meant they could voluntarily attest for service at a later date, then they'd be released to civilian life, and then they would be called back up when they were required. And it's fairly fair to assume that Montague was one of these men. And this scheme was hugely popular. They had so many men applying, they had to actually um, dispense with medical examinations because they just didn't have the ability to do them. Um, so while we have this information about Montague, sadly it, sh it appears that his military service record was part of the 60% that went up in smoke during the Arnside Fire of 1940. It's a tragic shame, but if you weren't aware, uh, only 40% of First World War service records have survived due to a fire that destroyed them all, and that's why, well not all, but 60%, that's why we call them the burnt records. And when you look at these original documents, you will often see singes and burn marks, but that's not the only resource we have. So we can, look, we can look for him in our collection of medal index cards, and that's where we find him. And when we find his medal index card, it shows us all the different services he served in. So as well as serving in the Royal, uh, in the Royal Air Force, or Royal Flying Corps, we see that he also served in the Hampshire Regiment under the service number 35516, and later with the Inniskilling Fusiliers, Inniskilling Fusiliers, with the number 41319. And service numbers are important, because when you put those in, um, you can get other records, but they will also give you clues. So I hope this makes sense, but so his Ham I'll give you an idea of how you can gather information just by looking at a service number. So his Hampshire regi Regiment number, he had a different number for each regiment, so his Hampshire Regiment number suggests a date earlier than 19 March 1917. So for instance, we, we take another soldier in the regiment who we do have a service record for, a chap called Harry Harper, He's mentioned in the blog, and he had a service number which was 35531. Harry attested on the Derby scheme on the 12th of December 1915. We see this in his service record. We see that he was mobilised in Winchester in February 1917 and joined the Hampshire Regiment the following day, which was when he was given his number, 35531. Given that Montague's number was a few digits lower than this, it's, a, it's fair to assume that he joined the army in February 1917. So um, do, do you see what I mean? His, his, his service number was lower than Harry Harper, who joined in late 1917. So it makes sense, given that his number was lower, that he joined earlier than that. And I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm making sense. But, but so now we've got a rough date for when he joined the Hampshires. And then we can look at the regimental history. Uh, and we can also see that... Um, According to his so some of the Hampshire regiment and some of, some of the Hampshire regiment and some of the Inskilling Fusiliers, some were sent to Palestine, some were sent to France, and without a service record, we don't know exactly which. So we take another look at his RAF papers, and that shows that he was treated in 1917 at the Canadian General Hospital in Boulogne um, for dermatitis, probably contracted while he was serving in the trenches, you know, the awful conditions affecting his health. So that means knowing that he was sent to a Canadian hospital on the Western Front, we can rule out him being sent to Palestine. So we know that he was with one of the battalions that was in France, and then we can look at the regimental history and we'll see that in 1917, Hans men uh, fought in the battles of Arras, Vimy, Scarpe, Messonine, uh, Men in Road, Polygon Wood, Passchendaele, Cambrai, lots. And then we can do the same for the in, in, in the Skilling Fusiliers. We can see that they also fought at Scarpe. Uh, Cambrai, Battle of Langemark. So we can get a rough idea of his experiences, if, if that makes sense. Also, when we look at his Inskilling in Fusiliers number, we can again assess the dates. His number 41319 dates to about the 13th of June. Um, and there is evidence of other men from the Hampshire Regiment moving across at that time. So that I hope that makes sense. It might sound a bit complicated, but I just wanted to show how Purely interrogating service numbers can give you clues, despite the lack of a service record. I hope that's helpful. I, I've been, I was taught this by Paul Nixon, who's our military expert, who you've seen on here before. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know that. That's something I actually learned quite recently, and I've been playing around with it, and it does work. Um, I'll have to see, maybe we should write a blog on that, actually, on how to use service numbers. We should. We really should. Um, anyway, so, yeah, after we... we Go back, going back to his RF record, we see that he was sent back to England uh, and then he was admitted to the second Western General Hospital in Manchester. But there's no evidence that he went back to France, so it's pretty fair to assume that he 
transferred from the army to the Royal Flying Corps in England. And he did this on the 6th of March, 1918. Obviously, the Royal Flying Corps became part of the Royal Air Force on the 1st of April, 1918. Uh, and his service record shows that he served with 91 Squadron as an air mechanic third class and was later upgraded to air mechanic second class. So he didn't fly, but he still did a very, very important job. Uh, he was eventually transferred to the RAF reserves um, on the 4th of March, 1919. So he was still in service long after the war had ended. Well, not long, but quite a long time after the war had ended. Uh, and he was discharged on the 30th of April in 1920. And that was the end of Montague's war. After the war, he returned to his native Dorset, but sadly he didn't get to enjoy peace for long because he died only eight years later after leaving the services. He died uh, in 1928, just 52 years old in Bournemouth. I haven't been able to find a cause of death, but I wonder whether his life was shortened by his experiences in the trenches of the Western Front. So there you go. That was my garbled, garbled story about Colin Firth's ancestors. Yes, I need some more service numbers will be black, will, would be fab. Consider me on it. And Lydia Joy, oh, hello from California. Wow, that's cool. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, if anyone's just tuning in now, I'm going to sign off now, say bye, wish you a happy weekend. But you can obviously rewatch this back at your leisure. I'm also going to post links when I get off this to all the blog posts I've mentioned. That'll be the real runners of the First World War, Colin Firth's family tree, and tips for tracing your World War I ancestors. So stick around and check out the comments if you want to read more. And I will be back again next Friday with more of this. Um, thank you for sticking with me. This has been a particularly long one, but I love World War I. Uh, and I like talking about it. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and I will be off to see 1917 tomorrow. Uh, if anyone sees it, perhaps we could have a discussion around it and what we think. Before I go, I'll take a quick look at a few more comments. Trevor Newsom, my grandfather on my mother's side was in the machine gun corps, serving the Western Front in 1917. After the war, he was never the same. Yeah, my, grand, my great grandfather wasn't either. He, despite being married to uh, a woman of means, he um, became a hoarder and was very, very eccentric and also became deeply socialist. And we think to the extent where he gave away like six properties in Cornwall that were belonged to his wife, not him. As soon as she died, as soon as she, well, as soon as he got control of the state, he just gave him away. We think that's because being in the trenches made him very averse to the class system. Um, yeah, no, um, thank you for sharing that. Karen Harvey said, um, if I can find it, hi, Alex. Um, also, I, I look at where men in the battalion fell from Commonwealth's war graves to show what they're involved in. That is a very, very good tip as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, another good point as well. Thank you for reminding me. Katrina Worthy said, some, sometimes a person can have more than one service record as they have served in a different regiment or a volunteer regiment. Very good point. Um, Oh, and sorry, back to Travis comment. He said he came back never the same. Trevor Newsom uh, left left his wife and her children, um, and sadly, Trevor's mum never knew him. War devastates life for generations. I'm going to like that comment because it's so so true. War does devastate lives for generations and generations and generations, and hopefully, something like this will never happen again. Uh, I'm sure we're all watching the news, so let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, and the final comment before I go, Cheryl Sanderson just discovered ancestors from Yorkshire who were in Canada when World War, broke, World War I broke out and they enlisted in the forces there. More search risk needed early days. Well, keep us posted. That sounds like a fun pro uh, product, project. And as and I can always rely on you to say great tips. Uh, she's had lots of great military groups and specifically military genealogy groups worth having a wee search on Facebook to see what you can find. Again, got to like that because that is a fantastic piece of advice. Right, well, thank you to everybody who lasted the full one hour, 25 minutes. Uh, I will see you next Friday. Um, and yeah, have wonderful weekends. Um, if you enjoy 1917, let us know on Facebook. I'll be back again for more, more family history fun and discussion next Friday. Happy weekend. Bye, 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 bye. Bye, 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 bye. See you.